Controlling insects is important to a producer's bottom line. Wise pest management means more grower profits and fewer insecticides in the environment. Hello, I'm Chris Sansone, entomologist with the Texas Agricultural Extension Service, and I want to discuss with you the benefits of using an integrated pest management approach for cotton insect control. More commonly known as IPM, it's a unique system that's been emphasized in Texas cotton production since 1972. Any IPM programs must be environmentally and economically sound. This is accomplished by combining cultural practices like planting insect resistant varieties and biological controls with selective insecticide use. These combined practices are used to check pest populations while protecting the environment by eliminating unneeded chemical use. One of the most effective ways of reducing chemical use is evaluating when or if pests have reached economically damaging levels. This is accomplished through crop monitoring or field scouting. Field scouting, the art of actually observing and knowing the meaning of insect damage, is critical. Scouting is an important component of any IPM program. Without it, Producers can't know when or if pest control is needed. Scouting is a process of gathering information needed to evaluate when or if insects have reached damaging levels. The scout survey tells the producer what is currently happening in his field. Without constant monitoring, pesticides might be applied at the wrong time for the wrong insect. Pest management is best done through several suppression tactics rather than just one. To optimize the multi-tactic approach, the producer must know which insects are helpful and which may cause damage. This is done only by crop monitoring. Collecting useful crop information is scouting's main objective. Because scouting is used to make decisions, producers must understand one important concept. The economic injury level, or EIL, is the break-even point where dollars a producer can lose to the pest is equal to the cost of controlling a pest. Pest managers should know that the EIL is not static. It's affected by the amount of injury done to the crop, the yield or quality loss, market value for increments of crop loss, and cost of control. Cotton must be scouted every four or five days because pest populations vary through time. Scouting or sampling results should be recorded on an easily understood form or report. A representative area of the whole acreage must be sampled since a single species is rarely found uniformly across a field. Scouting only near turn rows and field margins is misleading because it never yields the full insect damage picture. To scout properly, make sure that all parts of the field are covered. The pattern should allow adequate sampling across the field, including the center, sides, and corners. If the field is large, don't sample the same area on successive scouting days. The number of field samples needed is dictated by field size and variability. In general, the more plants scouted, the better. At least 40 or 50 plants should be inspected on each sample date. Fields over 100 acres should have more plants inspected so that all portions of the field are well scouted. Damage to plants will vary in location and size with each pest. Some insects infest cotton squares, others prefer terminal buds, and a few prefer only the leaves. For best results, include the top, middle, and lower plant portions in your samples. Other information can and should be collected while you're scouting for insects. Plant stand counts, fruiting rates, and weed infestations are all useful pieces of data to growers. Later in the season, Nodes above white flower and open bowl percentages can also aid management decisions. Adult female thrips lay their eggs in plant tissue. The eggs hatch in about six days. The two larval stages are completed in another six days. Egg to adult development requires about 16 days and mated females live about 35 days. Thrips plague many plants year round in most areas. They are minute, slender, agile insects. They rarely exceed one-fifth of an inch in length, and their color varies from yellowish brown, black, tan, or sometimes orange. Adults have narrow wings fringed with hair. They can damage cotton up to the fourth and fifth true leaf stage. Their main damage occurs when cotton growth slows during cool conditions. 
the rips are worst when native hosts such as wildflowers are present or in cotton fields close to maturing small grains. Thrips damage terminal buds and cotton leaves. They are generally not a problem after the fifth true leaf stage. Their feeding rupture cells causing stunted plants and crinkled upward curling leaves. Terminal buds may be destroyed during severe infestations causing excessive plant branching and delayed plant growth. Scouting for thrips is important because weather damage is easily mistaken for thrips problems. Remember that thickened leaves and upward curling leaf edges are the classic signs of thrips infestation. Adult and immature aphids are soft-bodied sucking insects. They vary in color from pale yellow to dark green. They are easily distinguished from other cotton pests by their slow, deliberate movement and the presence of cornicles. Aphids are present during most of the season. However, it's important for the cotton scout to recognize aphids early in the season for a number of reasons. First, they can be confused with cotton flea hoppers, and so it's important for the cotton scout to be able to distinguish between cotton aphids and other insects infesting cotton. Also, aphids can sometimes be a problem early in the season, and early detection helps in monitoring population development. Aphid biology is unique because most are females young or born alive. One female can yield up to 80 juveniles that mature within eight to 10 days. Early season aphids will be under leaves in the plant terminal. They suck the plant's juices, causing downward curling leaves that cuff under. This is in contrast to thrips upward curling leaf damage. Cotton flea hoppers are among the hardest insects to monitor in cotton because they bolt when disturbed. Adults and nymphs are sensitive to movement and small light changes. The nymphs are more movement sensitive than the adults and may run down the main stem if disturbed. Always approach the plant while facing into the sun. If your shadow falls on the plant, the flea hopper will move quickly. A slow, cautious approach yields the best scouting results. A careful search of the terminal is needed to find the smaller nymphs. The immature nymph is pale green with big, often reddish eyes. The pest overwinters in the egg stage, usually in the wild host. The eggs hatch when temperatures reach the 70s. The nymphs molt five times and become adults in 14 to 15 days. Adults are about an eighth inch long. They are flat with an elongated oval outline and prominent antenna. The body is usually yellowish green, though it may be white or yellow, with minute black hairs and spots on the upper surface. Cotton flea hoppers are around most of the season. The damage window lasts from squaring to first bloom. Like thrips, cotton flea hoppers are most numerous when wild hosts such as woolly croton, horse mint, and silver leaf nightshade appear before planting. Cotton flea hoppers, adults, and nymphs feed on the anthers or pollen sacs of small squares. The feeding causes the squares to turn brown and die, resulting in a blasted appearance. The pest causes heavy fruit loss, and the loss can extend crop maturity. The boll weevil is a season-long problem. The adult is a brown to grayish brown beetle. The body is covered with short, fine hair, and the size varies from one eighth to one half of an inch. The weevil snout is about half as long as its body, the snout is curved slightly with chewing mouth parts at the end. Boll weevils overwinter as adults. Survival is best in areas that accumulate leaf litter. Fence rows, broadleaf plant litter along creek bottoms, ditch banks, and other protected areas are ideal overwintering sites. The boll weevil emerges in the spring, depending on day length and temperature, and concentrates in squaring cotton fields near their overwintering areas. Monitoring for boll weevil adults is often difficult before bloom, so scouts should learn to recognize early season damage caused by overwintered boll weevils. Boll weevils are pollen feeders. They have a hard time surviving without squaring cotton, though they can survive for a short time by feeding on terminals. Terminal feeding is recognized by dead, blackened leaves in a condition often called flagging. Adults mate after feeding on cotton squares for three to seven days. 
The females lay their eggs in squares of at least one quarter of an inch in diameter. Egg laying may occur in smaller squares, but not enough food is available for larvae to reach the adult stage. Controlling overwintering boll weevils can delay the buildup of economically damaging levels until the second weevil generation. Management methods vary with each cotton growing region, but populations must be monitored to determine if control measures are needed. Field scouts must search 100 whole plants at squaring for the presence of adult boll weevils. An alternative method has the scout checking every plant within 100 row feet. Pheromone trapping is another tool used in some areas to determine when treatment is needed. If traps catch above a given number of weevils per week, then treatment is justified. Control measures for overwintered boll weevils should start when the first one quarter inch diameter squares are found. When adult boll weevils emerge from cotton squares, they feed for three to seven days and then mate. The female prefers to lay eggs in squares one quarter of an inch or larger in diameter, though egg laying can occur in small bowls, especially as the season progresses. The eggs hatch into a grub-like larva in two to four days. Each larva feeds inside a square or small bowl. They continue feeding for seven to 14 days before pupating inside the same square or small bowl. The pupal stage changes into an adult boll weevil over the next four to six days. The newly emerged adult is reddish brown immediately after emergence. They don't develop their fuzzy appearance for another seven to 10 days. Adult boll weevil feeding damage is characterized by yellow, dry fecal pellets called frass found outside the square, but inside the triangular bracts surrounding the square or flower bud. If the damage is old, the frass is orange. Both males and females feed. If a female decides her feeding site is suitable for egg laying, she will enlarge the cavity slightly and insert her ovipositor to deposit a single egg into the cavity. She then covers the cavity with a sticky secretion. This sticky substance hardens into a wart-like protuberance that is easily felt and seen. Once larval development begins, the infested square turns yellow, bracts open or flare, and the square or bowl usually falls off. Larger bowls may remain attached, but the feeding larva will ruin some of the lint and seeds. Cotton scouts must monitor for adults, feeding or egg laying damage, and shed squares. Adult monitoring is difficult because they feed inside the square bracts. If adults are easily found, it usually means a damaging population is already present. To spot boll weevils in time to control them, scouts must pick green squares. If yellow, flared squares are chosen, the damage level is vastly overestimated. 100 squares and small bowls of one quarter inch or greater in diameter should be selected. 25 squares or bowls should be picked from each of four representative locations in the field and from various positions on the plants. Look for the characteristic feeding or egg laying punctures. Monitoring should continue until the last harvestable bowls are the diameter of a quarter and are firm when squeezed. Remember, boll weevils are a season long problem. Once weevils become established, producers must constantly monitor their fields to make treatment decisions. The bollworm and tobacco budworm are similar in appearance and lifestyle. The adults emerge in the spring after overwintering in the soil in the pupal stage. After emergence, they complete two or three generations in other hosts before moving to cotton. The adult bollworm moths have a wingspan and body length of one and a half inches. The forewings vary from light brown or tan to reddish brown. They are marked by dark areas near the tip and a dark spot near the center. The hind wings are white to light tan with an irregular dark band on the outer rear margin. Tobacco budworm moths have a wingspan and body length of one and a quarter inches. Four wings are light olive green with three or four light colored oblique bands that look like a chevron. Both moth species enter cotton fields to feed on nectar. They lay eggs anywhere on the plant, but usually prefer the upper one third of the plant. Both species' eggs are similar. 
They are whitish and about the size of a pinhead. The eggs are hemispherical in shape, resembling an inverted teacup with ridges running along the side from the top center to the point of attachment on the plant. They are usually laid singularly. The eggs darken as they mature. They turn from a white to tan the first day and from tan to brown the second day. They usually hatch in two and a half to three days. The eggs can be confused with cabbage looper eggs, but looper eggs are flatter and are usually laid on the leaf's underside. Bullworm and tobacco budworm larvae feed on squares, blooms, and bowls for 14 to 18 days. Both have similar larval stages. The larvae are 1 16th of an inch long when hatched and grow to two inches. Larval color varies from light green to shades of green or brown, usually with stripes running the length of the body. The larvae drop from the plant and burrow into the soil once feeding stops. They pupate in the soil for 12 to 18 days. The complete life cycle may take 35 to 50 days, depending on the temperature. Cotton damage is caused by larvae tunneling into squares, blooms, and bowls while feeding. Injured squares turn yellow and the bracts flare and drop off in three to five days. Good scouting depends on finding the eggs in small larvae. The eggs and larvae are usually found in the plant's terminals. This is where the first search should be made. The eggs are usually laid on the newer terminal leaves. Newly hatched larvae are found inside the terminal or flower buds. Damage evidence is often seen before the newly hatched larvae are located. The evidence is larvae frass, which will be moist, brown, and contain silk. After a careful terminal search, the rest of the plant square should then be inspected. When it's hot, Bullworm and tobacco budworm adults sometimes lay their eggs in the lower plant portions. However, more often, terminal searches are enough, though whole plant inspections will eliminate any surprises. Cotton aphid biology and identification were covered earlier in the video. We will now discuss mid to late season aphid scouting. As we've already learned, cotton aphids are rarely a threat until first bloom. During the mid to late season, aphid feeding can cause reduced bowl size and seed production, resulting in reduced yields. Scouting is important because aphid management must be planned well before the economic injury level is reached. By the time the aphid's waste product, honeydew, is seen, the field may have already suffered some economic loss. Scouts should pull leaves from the plant's top and middle portion. The best sample site is the first fully expanded terminal leaf. Scouts must be certain to randomly select leaves so that their estimate will not be biased. Aphids should be counted on each leaf with an average aphid number per leaf calculated. Check adequately since aphids are not uniformly distributed across a given field. This lack of uniformity is also a good reason for sampling leaves from the plant's top and middle portion. The adult beet armyworm is a non-distinct grayish-brown moth with a lighter spot near the center of each forewing. The wingspan is one and a quarter inches. The female lays 500 to 600 eggs over a four to 10 day period. The eggs hatch in two to five days depending on the temperature. The newly hatched larvae are white with black heads. Eventually, the larvae will develop a conspicuous black dot on each side of the second body segment behind the head. When hatched, the larvae first spin a light web over the foliage while feeding together in a group. The larvae skeletonize portions of the leaf with the resulting damage called a hit. As the larvae develop, they leave the plant where they were hatched. As they grow older, their feeding shift from the leaves to the cotton fruit. The larvae will then feed from 18 to 24 days before burrowing into the soil to pupate five to eight days before emerging as adults. Beet armyworm larvae are distinguished from bullworm and tobacco budworm larvae by their smooth skin and lack of body hair. Beet armyworms can also be distinguished from fall armyworms. Beet armyworms have a black dot on the second segment behind the head and don't have the fall armyworm's inverted Y markings on the front of a dark brown head. The beet armyworm is only an occasional cotton pest, 
but when it hits, the results can be devastating. Most problems occur in drought-stricken areas or where natural enemies have been reduced, usually due to early season insecticide applications. Beet armyworm larvae can damage cotton all season long, but usually cause the most damage after squaring. Prior to squaring, damage is confined to larvae skeletonizing leaves and causing stand loss by destroying plant terminals. Feeding damage to squares and young bulls can become extensive during the squaring and early blooming period. The damage is similar to bullworm and tobacco budworm larvae, but more leaf skeletonizing occurs and beet armyworm larvae feed on the bracts surrounding the squares, blooms, or bulls. The threat of crop loss is reduced as bulls reach maturity. Early detection of a beet armyworm outbreak is important. Several field areas should be inspected because beet armyworm distribution is not uniform. Scouts should examine cotton plants along 100 row feet for active hits. Active hits are recently hatched egg masses with actively feeding larvae. To determine the number of larvae per acre, scouts should use the same whole plant search techniques they use in bullworm and tobacco budworm monitoring. Now that we have looked at some of the major pests that impact Texas cotton, take time to review the tape again and study the biologies and proper scouting techniques offered in this video. The more often you scout a field, the better you will become at detecting pest populations. By using the knowledge gained in this program, you will become a better crop manager and more proficient in making good pest management decisions. You may encounter a number of other insects in cotton fields including many beneficial species. There are a number of good available references from your local extension service. If you have any additional questions or need more scouting information, please contact your local extension service. By using the information provided in this video, as well as other sources such as the Field Guide to Cotton Insects and Natural Enemies of Cotton Insects, you will become a better crop manager and more proficient in making pest management decisions. If you have further questions or need further information on cotton insect scouting, please contact your local extension service.